So yes, a very warm welcome to this tent on this hot afternoon. I'm going to be talking, my name is Ratnadeva, and I'm going to be talking on a, a theme which is absolutely central to Buddhism, to Buddhist doctrine, to Buddhist thinking, to Buddhist practice. And that is the theme of ethics. Uh, the title is, I'm born of my actions. So we'll be looking at the Buddhist sense of freedom, freedom from suffering specifically. We'll be looking at how we limit that freedom. We'll be looking at how we can use actions, how we can use karma, action. We can use the law of karma to break through the limiting constraints, the habits, uh, the, the, the conditioning. So that's, that's to the tra trajectory of, of the talk today. I was in Nottingham back in 2008, uh, living above the Nottingham Buddha Center. And the, the Dalai Lama came to town for a five-day presentation on investigating the nature of reality. And he gave talks, very profound talks. But I'm afraid, alas, I can't remember anything he said. <laughs> but what I can remember is his chuckle, his laughter. It was, it was beautiful. Every now and again, maybe you've seen him on, on TV and you've seen the same thing. And I do have a sense that that chuckle, that laughter, was expressive of a very deep theme, uh, uh, attitude within the Buddhist tradition. It was lovely this morning to hear the, it must be laughter yoga, is it going on somewhere? The, the, just the laughter kind of drifting over the early morning fields. We even have a mantra in, in the Buddhist tradition which has laughter in it. The Vajrasattva, the hundred syllable Vajrasattva mantra. S for those of you who know it, Sarva Karma Suchame, Chitam Shriya Kuru Hong, Ha 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 Ho. What does this express? It's kind of, for me, certainly a lightness of spirit, a fearlessness. Fear, I mean, uh, I think about my own fear, you know, will, will the trains run when I'm trying to get back home or will there be a strike? Just uh, at this moment, happily, I'm not so fearful, but, you know, coming here to give a talk, I'm sure we all have that experience of standing up, up front, fear. Um, I, I'm, I'm in London at the moment and I, I do look at people when I'm walking down the street, whether it's a street or a field, I look at people, such a contrast in these fields, looking at the people's faces and looking into people's faces on the tube or in, in the streets of London. There's an oppressiveness. There's a, of course, I'm reading this in. That there's, there's, the, it feels like fear is in the air. Uh, the, just the expressions of the faces. Maybe you can relate to what I'm talking about. And it could, you know, it's totally um, understandable. Fear of, you know, price hikes, COVID, uh, uncertainty in the world. Buddhism has a, a promise, a promise of fearlessness based on freedom, freedom, freedom from any oppression. The Buddha says, just as the ocean has but one taste, the taste of salt, so my teaching has the taste of freedom. So if you've got any so-called Buddhist practice and you're not feeling free as a result of engaging with that practice or freer, it's not a Buddhist practice. At least your manifestation of it isn't. You probably know something of the story of the Buddha. His, his main task, his quest, if you like, from, from when he left home, he went forth from a life of luxury his main quest was to tackle this problem of suffering, the issue of suffering, the meaning of suffering. Later, he says in his teaching, I, I teach suffering and an end to suffering. So suffering is there very much in center stage in, in Buddhism. But happily, the Buddha found a solution. Under the Bodhi tree 2,500 years ago, that's the reason we're all here today. So he had, a, he had lived the life of luxury, he was very privileged, the life of hedonism. He had then 
f- finding the emptiness of that, he, and finding that that didn't lead to an end of suffering, quite the opposite, he, he, he tried extreme asceticism, wandered with practitioners and almost killed himself through the extremity of his practices. But then he finally tapped into just a natural human happiness, unforced, a happiness which he discovered was just intrinsic to our human consciousness. It's a question of discovering. He, and he discovered that, this, that the mind, the mind heart, Buddhism doesn't... So, when, when we hear Buddhism teachings about Buddhism referring to the mind, it really means mind heart. Chitta is a word in Pali. The mind, he discovered that the mind heart is self-luminous. This, this clarity is intrinsic to our consciousness. He entered a deep current of human possibility. Perfect wisdom, seeing things as they are. Perfect or great compassion, maha karunya, where we are open to our own experience, you know, fully open to our joys, our sorrows, really being with them, experiencing them. But also open to the sorrows and joys of the world. Trem- a quote from, from the early Buddhist writing, trembling for the welfare of all living beings. So you could say, one way of looking at the Buddhist tradition over the past two and a half thousand years is that it is an attempt to communicate the Buddha's experience of enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, the Buddha's experience of freedom freedom from suffering. <clears throat> After his, he experienced that, that awakening, he felt he, he needed to communicate it very naturally. So he went to Sarnath. So he had his enlightenment experience in Bodh Gaya, and then he traveled to Sarnath, where he knew his previous colleagues in, in the ascetic life were, were, were hanging out. And he, he wanted to join them and communicate to them what he had experienced, this awakening. And the form in which he expressed this, this, this teaching, this experience, was in the Four Noble Truths. The first Noble Truth is there is suffering in life. You have a human body, you have a human consciousness, there's going to be suffering. You cannot escape the rub. The second Noble Truth is that the, the source the, the condition on which suffering arises is craving, craving aversion. So aversion being kind of a form for, of craving, craving for something to not be the case, pushing away. So the third noble truth is, is, is where we get uh, a, a bit optimistic, but it says there is the possibility of an end to, to craving, therefore there is the end there is a possibility of the end of suffering. And the, the fourth noble truth is, well, this is the path. So he outlines the eightfold noble path, a very practical path as to how to end craving and therefore end suffering. Now, there's a key insight here in the second noble truth. It is um, that the cause of suffering is in our minds. Quoting the early... Uh, scripture experiences are preceded by mind, led by mind, produced by mind. So, so our suffering comes from within us. It's an internal response to external experiences. Now, this is good news. Okay, we have some control over external circumstances, sure, but maybe not a lot. I mean the whole COVID episode is teaching us how little control we have. And just our daily external circumstances, experiences of pleasure and pain, gain and loss, praise, blame, fame, disrepute. These are known as, as the, the worldly winds, the eight worldly winds. They blow us around the place. Now, how do we respond to them? This, this is, if you like, the, 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 the nugget of freedom how, is in our response to these, these conditions. And whatever our habitual responses to these conditions, you know, 
we may not be able to change them, but what we can change is our minds. So in order to steer a path towards happiness, rather than wanting to change reality, the world, those worldly winds to conform to our desires, we can change our desires so that they are in line with reality. It's an internal chain, change. And this, according to the Buddhist path, is feasible. This is what the Buddhist path is about. It's about changing our minds, bringing them into conformity with reality. So the, the question is, the next logical question is, well, how stuck are we? Um, how easy is it for us to, to change our minds? Uh, tonight we'll be working with a symbol in the ritual, in the main ritual at uh, nine o'clock, which is centered on the, the wheel of life. Um, and the wheel of life is, is a description, very graphic description of how stuck we can be just reacting to our experience habitually. In, in, because you know, here we are, we're, we're on this planet uh, and we're subject to so many conditions. Uh, our parents, our schooling, uh, the culture we're in, we didn't have a lot of choice in these conditions. But they are seeds, if you like. And so, so as included in, in that conditioning is our own actions and our uh, experiences that, have, that we've met with during, during our lives. All of these come together as seeds, if you like. So engaging with this, the theme of, of the event, uh, the, the, the festival, um, Seeds of the Heart. Thich Nhat Hanh says, In us are infinite varieties of seeds, seeds of sansara, seeds of nirvana, delusion and enlightenment, seeds of suffering and happiness, seeds of perceptions, names and words. So all of these are in the mix, all of these conditions. And we end up with, well, a bundle of habits, you could, you could say, um, more or less ingrained, deeply ingrained, which represent a, an automatic or unthinking response to our experience. For example, you know, so, someone criticizes you. Maybe what's, what's your automatic response to being criticized? Is it, is it defensiveness? Is it to go on a counterattack? So in the face of these habits, to what extent are, are we in the driving seat of our own, our own lives? How free are we? Of course, there are the even more intense habits, uh, addictions, compulsive. Could be browsing social media, could be alcohol, vaping, pornography. And then there are the habits of mind, views, habitual ways of seeing the world. And these form a, a lens through which we see the world, which therefore, because that's how we see the world, that shapes our experience, it shapes our response to the world. In a sense, our views create the world we live in. The world we imagine ourselves to be in is only one possible world that we could imagine ourselves to be in. So if we look at our views, how many of them are limiting and therefore limit our world? For example, you know, I'm not good enough. This is who I am. I can't change. I'm not going to change. So how do we go about changing? How do we get unstuck? The, the key tool in the toolbox for a Buddhist for getting unstuck is karma, action. Karma is the Sanskrit for action. The Pali is kama. So you might see it referred to in, in, as either. But what is karma? Well, let's, let's, let's go into karma now in a bit of detail. First of all, how important is karma? Buddha says, actions actually shape us. They make us what we are. I am, I am the owner of my actions, heir of my actions. I am born of my actions. So every action changes us. This is partly confirmed, validated by neuroscience. Neuroscience will tell us that with every conscious action we make, uh, a neural pathway is created. S 
it's like, like an internal line of, of communication established in our brains. And this influences our future behavior. It's like um, creating a path in a field. Once, once you do something once, once you walk through a wheat field, you, it's so much easier to you follow that path again and again. It's, you, you've established the trackway. So it's, it's e once you do an act once, it's easier to repeat that action. So our actions predispose us to future action. The seeds of the heart metaphor that the, the, the festival is engaging with really is, is uh, a beautiful poetic, if you like, um, presentation of, of, of our evocation of this fact. So in action, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a character. So a character, reap a destiny. That's from Ralph Waldo Emerson. So every action, however small, and actions are cumul accumulative, changes. The Buddha says, do not underestimate good, thinking it will not affect me. A watered pot becomes full by the constant falling of drops of water. Similarly, the wise person, little by little, fills themselves with good. So every act, however small, is significant, potentially significant. And this is kind of scary, that every action of ours has an impact, can have an impact. There's a responsibility in there, in terms of the people with whom we are connected and who are affected by our actions. But it's also exciting, for me at least. This offers a creative possibility. It's empowering. We can get unstuck. We can shape ourselves to become the people that we want to be. Again, Thich Nhat Hanh. The quality of our life depends on the quality of the seeds that lie, lie deep in our consciousness. And we are sowing these seeds deep in our consciousness constantly through action. Another way of putting it that Sangharachita likes is, or liked, was uh, we are our greatest work of art. If you like, karma, action, is the chisel, chiseling ourselves, the person we want to be out of the rock face. Karma, if you like, is a potential mechanism for change. It's the tool of our deliverance. But only if we know how to make use of it, how, how to direct the change in the way we want it to go. And a help in that direction is to deepen our knowledge or understanding of karma. So let's go a bit deeper into karma. What do we mean by karma, actually? Let's define it a little before we proceed. Buddhism is quite specific about what it means. In, it, it is intentional, in other words, willed, willed actions. It's not any action. So if you have um, on an tend uh, consequences, say you're walking in the, in the field and you step on an ant uh, accidentally, that's not karma, that's not, not a, a, a volitional, intentional action. Intentions themselves are actually karma. So even before you, you perform the act, the intention to perform the act is karma. Chaitana is, is karma, is Chaitana is, is, is the Pali word for, for um, intention. So intention stands as an action on its own. So if you intend to carry out a certain act, but you, you, you get prevented from performing that act, the intention, whether it's skillful or unskillful, is karma. I'll, and I'll talk about skillful, unskillful very shortly. Just one other part of describing karma uh, is to broaden it. Certainly from a Buddhist perspective, karma, uh, kama, action includes traditionally known as the threefold acts. Acts of body, acts of speech, so words. Words are, are, are karma. And acts of mind, thoughts are karma. Again, insofar as they are intentional. So having defined karma a bit, let's talk about the law of karma. What is the law of karma about? Well, I, th I, th um, I think this might come from Divan, this quote. Uh, 
karma might be described, the law of karma may be described as a natural law governing our intentional actions and their experienced effects. So our, the law that govern our intentional actions and their experienced effects. Uh, putting that a bit more si simply, actions have consequences. As you sow, so shall you reap. What goes around comes around. And just to clarify, uh, the consequences of our actions, whatever they may be, that's, that's in Buddhism, uh, in Buddhist terms, is, is described as kama vipaka, the fruits of kama. So if, if you conjecture, you know, something happens to you and say, oh, that's my, that's my karma. What you mean is that's my karma vipaka, the fruits of my action. Just, just for clarity. And I'll come back to this conjecture a little later and question it, this, this idea that, oh, Something that happened to me is, is the fruit of my karma. So actions have consequences. There are two types of action, at least in the Dvaita Vitaka Sutta, again one of the early Buddhist writings, the Buddha distinguishes between, his, in, in his experience and in his meditation, he says, oh, these, these actions, there are, and there are these actions, there are skillful wholesome actions and there are unskillful, unwholesome actions. So we're talking about actions in terms of karmic consequences, the outcomes. Actions have consequences. The skillful, wholesome actions result, again in, from the Dveda Vitaka Sutta, lead to happiness, foster discernment, promote calm, lead to unbinding. Unskillful, unwholesome actions lead to affliction, obstruct discernment, promote fixation, and do not lead to unbinding. unbinding. So let's look a bit more closely at skillful, wholesome actions. It's one of two types of actions in terms of karmic consequences. So skillful actions arise in dependence upon skillful intentions. So reiterating the importance of intention. Intention is a crucial condition for the nature of the action. Skillful condition, intention, skillful action, unskillful intention, unskillful action. At least, yeah, that's simplifying, but I'll, I'll let that stand. So this is kind of intuitive, isn't it? Because say, say you experience somebody giving, you don't really know. So an act of generosity you witness. Uh, you don't really know what's going on in the person's heart, uh, head, heart, chitta. Um, it, it may well be they've seen a need and they've addressed it out of generosity of spirit. Or it could be they have a vested interest in giving in order to gain something a bit down the road. You know, if I give now, so I'll get back later on, or my reputation, I'll be seen as a generous person, I'll have this, my name emblazoned over a, a department of whatever. Um, I like the quote from T.S. Eliot, Murder in the Cathedral, the last temptation is the greatest treason to do the right deed for the wrong reason. So skill, sure, um, oops. The last temptation is the greatest treason to do the right deed for the wrong reason. So where do skillful intentions come from? So we've, we've, we've kind of seen skillful actions, skillful intentions. Skillful intentions do not arise in a vacuum. They arise in dependence upon skillful mental states. Skillful mental states are states uh, variations on the theme of generosity, love, and wisdom. So, as, for example, a, a skillful mental state like contentment provides conditions for peaceful intentions to arise and for calm actions to result. Goodwill, a, a mental state, a skillful mental state like goodwill, provides conditions for kind intentions to arise. Out of kind intentions or independence upon, generosity might arise. 
in the skillful mental state of clarity of mind, wise intentions may arise. And out of wise intentions, who knows, uh, helpful words, generosity might arise. So these are intimately interlinked, the, 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 the actions, the intentions, and the mental states. Skillful intentions arise in dependence upon men, skillful mental states. Skillful actions arise in dependence upon skillful intentions. But this, it doesn't stop there. And this is crucial in terms of getting out of any kind of ruts we might be in, breaking through any habits. And that is that the, the skillful action that may have started with the skillful mental state reinforces the skillful mental state. So just an example from my own experience while I was writing this talk, I was in my flat in uh, uh, Ilford and um, fruit flies became a problem. And I don't know if you ha are, have experienced this, once they start, like they just multiply and multiply. And um, instead of swatting them, I didn't want to, I don't, I don't like swatting insects. It's, uh, for me, it's an ethical issue. Um, so what I've been doing is so getting a mug and capturing and, and a card and, and taking them one by one out to the back window and letting them go. And, I, and, I, and I've used it, I found I was able to use it. It's off my heart, connecting actually with that little being um, and wishing it well and saying, go well when I, let, when I release it out the window. And I, and I did it initially just 10 times and then there were, must have been 50 of them, I did it 50 times and then there were just every day. And I, I, I found that just by softening around the, the whole thing um, and, and if you like wishing them well, each one well, I was setting up a habit and I was, I, it, it spilt over into meeting people. Seeing people on the tube, I was, I was just continuing, in a sense, a, a, from a, a mental state that had been uh, set up through the, this, that action. So you can see how uh, the, the mental state, it's kind of a, a, a virtuous circle. I, I, you could even describe it as an engine of change, an engine of liberation. Just like they say money makes money, well, skillful action generates skillful mental states, Skillful intentions, skillful actions, and this, this, this is this. You could say is a core teaching within Buddhism. This is the 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 path, the the way out of that wheel, uh, ever turning round, uh, stuck record of of the wheel of life. Again, that we'll be looking at tonight in the the ritual um, at uh, nine o'clock. Plug. <laughs> So this spiral, so rather than going around in a reactive state, this spiral is a, a creative mental state. It's mind creative rather than mind reactive. Increasingly positive mental states, increasingly less self-centered uh, uh, action, more open, mother, more other regarding, increasing calm, increasing concentration, increasing clarity. In, in this way, ethics, Skillful action, skillful intention, skillful mental states can be the, the, the basis for insight. The same goes for unskillful, unwholesome actions. They arise in dependence upon unskillful intentions, which arise in dependence upon unskillful mental states. How do we discern then between these two types of actions? the skillful and the unskillful. The Buddha gives us pointers in the form of the precepts. That's why, that's one of the reasons we chant to the positive precepts at the beginning of this session. So the negative form of the precepts is abstaining from, is the first is abstaining from, these are just summaries, abstaining from harm is the first, not taking the not given is the second, not engaging in sexual misconduct, the third, not speaking falsely, the fourth, and not clouding the mind with intoxicants is, is the fifth. We recited them in their positive form as love, generosity, contentment, stillness, simplicity and contentment, authenticity, truthfulness, and mindfulness. So they're the positive forms of the, of the precepts. So I don't have time to go into them here, just to illustrate what they are. And a key point is they're not rules, 
They're not commandments. That's the first thing to say about them. They're best thought of in terms of training principles that the Buddha has given us. If you like advice from a friend, a friend or a coach, you know, you go to the gym and you hope to get some sort of advice as to which machines to use, how many reps, depending on whether you want to build muscle, lose weight, whatever. But we're training, the Buddhist path is about training the spiritual muscles towards growth, towards happiness. So these precepts are that kind of advice from, and from, they're from someone who has our interests at heart, the Buddha, someone who is wise, who has the perspective, who comes from the perspective, sees the bigger picture, how things really are. So the precepts, these precepts, again, they're not rules, they're not, nor are they boxes to be ticked. They are arrows pointing in a direction. And you can see a thread going through all the five precepts. From non-harm or loving kindness through to mindfulness. And that thread is love. So the direction, the arrows are pointing in the direction of love. If you like, all the precepts are expressions of that first precept of love and non-harm. And that, that follows. And the stealing is harming as well, isn't it? Um, sexual misconduct is harm. Telling lies is harm. So the point I want to make here is that these are arrows pointing in a, in a, in a direction, not a box to be ticked. Uh, you, they're open-ended. You can never have too much love in your heart. You can never express too much love in your actions. They're described as the immeasurables. So love is the universal principle that guides the conscious universe. But... Let me put a little um, um, res reservation in there. Buddhism advises against reifying this principle, this principle of love, against making it into a thing, reifying it, for example, as a god, with a capital G. As far as Buddhism is concerned, the law of karma is impersonal. It's like the law of gravity. Buddhism is non-theistic. There is no creator, there is no redeemer, there is no judge apart from your own conscience. There's no authority. These are not commandments. There is no call for obedience. The emphasis is not on right or wrong. The language I've been using to date is skillful, unskillful. The problem you could, from what can be a problem with right and wrong is that these terms can become a, a stick with which to beat yourself up or a stick with which to beat others up. So, I've done wrong, I'm bad. You've done wrong. Moral judgmentalism, holier than thou. So we beat other people up. Now, one more point about the law of karma, which is, how does it operate? Well, it is mysterious. Uh, it's universal in its range. It's inexorable. The Buddha says, not in the sky, nor in the midst of the sea, nor yet in the clefts of the mountains. Nowhere in the world is there any place to be found where one can abide free from the consequences of one's deeds. So how does it work? How does this law of karma operate? Buddhism uh, uh, Bhante, our, our Sangharacha, the, the founder of Tri Ratna, he says, Buddhism has no mania for explanation, so you're not going to get an answer. We can resort to poetry, of course, again, referring to the, seed, the seeds metaphor. Karma is like a seed. You will yield a harvest from your actions. Karma, actions have consequences. When? When the conditions are conducive, when there's rain, when there's sunlight, when there's water, when there's nutrient. How will, will the seed fruit? In what form? Well, any action has many potential outcomes, just as any, any seed may uh, produce a plant which has an abundance of fruit or a plant that has very little fruit, or an abundance of, of, of foliage or very little foliage, or tall or small. So, the fruit of action often depends on other conditions, the soil, the climate, the availability of nutrient. 
this complex web of interacting conditions that is the world. So karma is only one, this is an important point to make, karma is only one of several different laws that govern conditions that create our experience. For example, there are other laws like physical laws that govern physical conditions like volcanic eruptions or earthquakes or say a tree blowing on our tent. That's not karma. Then there are organic or biological laws. So whether you catch COVID or not, or whether you develop diabetes as a result of your diet, or genetic disposition, or you know, these are on a biological level. These are not karma. Or at least what I'm saying is they don't have to be karma. There could be some amounts of karma in there. The point is you don't know. Not all our experiences are due to karma, is the point I'm making. With any given experience, we can't know how much it's the result of karma and how much it's the result of these other laws playing, whether it's the physical, biological, uh, psychological laws. So that's an important clarification. So I want to continue to talk about how do we go about how do we support ourselves in living the precepts, to live from the precepts? Because if Buddhism is anything, it's practical. How do we make the law of karma work for us? How do we live ethical lives? Well, Buddhism is optimistic. It's, it, in its terminology, even, you know, skillful, unskillful. Usually we think, well, a skill can be learned. We can train in it. We can develop it by doing it. The same applies with the Buddhist sense of ethics. And the most, I think uh, it, it's, it's fair to say, I don't think I'm, I'm going out on a limb here, that probably the greatest skill that we can acquire, that we can hone in order to support our practice of ethics is mindfulness, the practice of mindfulness. Now, there are three forms of mindfulness that relate to ethics. There are three ways of looking at mindfulness that point us in the direction of how it can support ethics. The first is mindfulness as recollection. Recollection, bringing ourselves together, all, one, all, all our sense faculties, coming into full presence with ourselves. This, this is a foundation for ethical practice, paying attention to our lives, and this, of course, is the emphasis of the secular mindfulness tradition. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, John Kabat-Zinn is kind of the, 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 the main originator, um, amongst many others. And the definition of mindfulness, of this form of mindfulness, of recollection, that comes from the secular mindfulness tradition is deliberate and non-judgmental attention to present moment experience turning up for our lives, you could say. And this is also there. This form, this, this definition of mindfulness is there in the, in the tradition, in the, in the ancient texts. Uh, so the Buddha says, a monk acts with mindfulness in going forth and back, in looking ahead or behind, in bending and stretching, in wearing his robe and carrying his bowl, in eating and drinking, in evacuating and urinating, in walking, standing, sitting, lying down, in speaking and in keeping silent. In this way, a monk is accomplished in mindfulness. But it's, I think it's beautiful the way the, the modern secular mindfulness tradition um, emphasizes this approach as mindfulness um, and, and, and presents it in a way that uh, perhaps invites certain people in who otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't, be in, wouldn't feel at home because it, it, it uh, removes the overtly religious dimension. And for a lot of people, you know, religion, they've had bad experiences. So there are huge benefits from the secular mindfulness tradition of mindfulness, meditation, for example, uh, a richer embodied experience rather than being trapped in our heads. That's my default place, being stuck in my head, rather than turning towards my, my direct experience, my sense experience. You know, um, I'm, I, once I've given the talk, I'll be able, I'll be more open to the sunshine and the color. Um, up to this point, I've been a bit in my head, I have to say. Um, and finding the positive in, in that, that world, that, 
and developing an appreciative awareness. So that's what the secular mindfulness, mindfulness meditation is very much directed towards. And that the evidence base is there for uh, the benefits, whether it's in terms of reducing stress, uh, high, dealing with high blood pressure, uh, insomnia, depression, boosting one's immune system, reducing chronic pain. All of these are amenable to mindfulness meditation. Now, that's the secular mindfulness tradition. Buddhism also emphasizes the, the need to, to, uh, to use mindfulness as a support for ethical behavior. Because our mental states, intentions and actions that we've, we've looked at as, as the epicenter of our ethical lives, well, they are part of our present moment experience. So, the, it, it, Buddhism emphasizes a development of a cultivation of a, a, an awareness of our mental states, our intentions and our actions in real time. As opposed to, say, uh, automatic pilot. I don't know how many times I've been losing my uh, water bottle in the past couple of days, just on automatic pilot and not remembering. Um, so mental states and intentions and our actions, they can simply be automatic responses to our experience. They can simply be habitual responses. However, the practice of mindfulness offers the possibility of freeing ourselves from this habitual responsiveness. If we can seize the moment, carpe diem, what does that mean? Buddhism would say there's a crucial ethical moment moment to moment there is there's a crucial ethical uh, dimension to the moment if you like a karmic leverage point and this is sometimes described as the gap and it's it's the gap is that uh, moment between our experience of pleasant unpleasant or neutral what's called feeling tone and our response so the feeling tone is you, you know everything you do whether it's lying on the floor or listening to a talk or having a cup of chai, there's a pleasantness to it or an unpleasantness to it, or it's like, not bother, it's neither one nor the other. Every experience has this feeling tone associated, and we have a, an immediate response, ouch, yummy, not bothered. So if we can abide with that uh, feeling tone, that pleasant unpleasantness uh, 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 neutrality, with awareness, with, that, that creates a kind of spaciousness. And this, I, I reckon that is an, a way of honouring, honouring our, our, our pain, honouring our pleasure by acknowledging it. It's the first stage in the sense in honouring it. So if we're criticised and we feel, oh, that hurts, just acknowledge that, that is honouring the pain. We can also acknowledge our knee-jerk response, that habitual automatic response to the pain. For example, if, uh, to lash out in counter-attack if someone criticizes us. But we can honor the knee-jerk reaction, the automatic response, by measuring it against ethical principles, against the precepts. So how does this, this action of mine lashing out when I'm criticized. How does it measure up against non-harm, loving-kindness, the first precept? And just by doing this, we have the possibility of an alternative response. That, that alternative response can be created out of the spaciousness we've, we've created. So rather than the experience being up here, it's like here. We've got it, we've got it in context. This is the creative mind at work, and this is, this is where choice can come in. We see an alternative, that's in line with the precepts, and we opt for that. This is freedom. So ethics, the precepts, plus mindfulness equals freedom. It's a bit simplistic, but um, conducive to freedom, let's say. And this, this is a true honouring of ourselves, of the person we want to become. This is conscious living.
I'm going to leave it there because uh, I've a lot more to say, but uh, um, it, is t it is time. It is time, and I don't want to go over time. So I'm very happy to open up to questions.